death-defying crash in Australia. A driver shoots across eight lanes of traffic without hitting another car before crashing into a business. Authorities say it is incredibly lucky no one else was injured. The four people in the car did not suffer serious injuries. After decades of suspicion and allegations, a guilty verdict tonight for disgraced singer R. Kelly. Late today, a jury found Kelly guilty of using his fame and the network of people at his disposal to sexually abuse women, girls, and boys. What comes next? And does this woman offer any closure for his accusers? Tonight, a public boost in confidence for boosters. President Biden publicly gets Pfizer's booster shot, but uses that as an opportunity to urge unvaccinated Americans once again to get that first shot. This comes as many mandates go into effect in New York starting today. 72,000 hospital workers in the state are still not vaccinated. The governor is putting the National Guard on notice to help with possible staffing shortages. Tonight, the fallout from that deadly Amtrak derailment in Montana. Passenger cars falling off the rails. Three people killed, seven injured. Investigators are now on the scene looking for the possible cause. Our Matt Gutman is in Montana tonight. Our in-depth report on canine dogs. As more states move to legalize marijuana, how are authorities changing how they deploy their canines, and can they still be effective? You believe these dogs are saving lives? Absolutely. Absolutely. And tonight, an up-close look at a disaster unfolding every hour of every minute of every day. Our James Longman traveled to the Arctic Circle to see Greenland's melting ice sheet for himself. He explains why what's happening thousands of miles away matters for us all. This is one of the most extraordinary walks I've ever been on. Walking through Greenland's ice sheet. And it's absolutely stunning. Looks like an absolutely stunning walk indeed. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. Well, he was one of the biggest names in music, vaulting to fame with songs like I Believe I Can Fly, Bump and Grind, and Ignition. Tonight, R. Kelly now faces the possibility of spending the rest of his life behind bars and stands convicted of using his fame and the network of people at his disposal to sexually abuse women, girls, and boys. Late today, a federal jury found R. Kelly guilty of racketeering and sex trafficking involving interactions with six women. Over the course of the six-week trial, prosecutors laid out in harrowing and graphic detail how R. Kelly was the ringleader of a criminal enterprise that bolstered his music, his image, and his sexual gratification by recruiting women and girls for sex, holding them against their will, and threatening them if they misbehaved. Some of the most gripping testimony came from a woman who said R. Kelly whisked her to his Chicago recording studio where she was kept locked up and was drugged before sexually assaulted by him while she was passed out. We are standing by to talk with R. Kelly's former bodyguard, but first, our Stephanie Ramos leads us off. Tonight, after decades of suspicion and allegations, it took just nine hours of deliberation for a Brooklyn jury to find R&B singer R. Kelly guilty on all counts. The singer facing decades in prison for eight counts of sex trafficking and one count of racketeering, alleging Kelly was the leader of an enterprise made up of individuals who would, quote, recruit women and girls to engage in illegal sexual activity with Kelly, arranging for them to travel to concerts throughout the United States. Today's guilty verdict forever brands R. Kelly as a predator who used his fame and fortune to prey on the young, the vulnerable, and the voiceless for his own sexual gratification. To the victims in this case, your voices were heard and justice was finally served. Over the course of six weeks, jurors hearing testimony from 50 witnesses, some of them victims, women, boys, and girls at the time. Gloria Allred represents several of the witnesses. I have been practicing law for 47 years. During this time, I have pursued many sexual predators who have committed crimes against women and children. Of all the predators that I have pursued, however, Mr. Kelly is the worst. ABC's Michael Strahan spoke with R. Kelly's longtime assistant, Diana Copeland, in August. They asked me during the trial, did you notice their reaction with males? And I did. Uh, they, they didn't want to speak to the males. In fact, sometimes they would ask me to interact with the males. 
So they didn't want to speak to the males, or were they told not to speak to the males? Well, that part piece I can't speak to because I don't know if they were told, but I would say that you can pretty much surmise that that was probably the case. One of Kelly's survivors testifying at the trial, saying she was a member of his fan club and she was just 16 years old when she met him. No one deserves what they experienced at his hands or the threats and harassment they faced in telling the truth about what happened to them. We hope that today's verdict brings some measure of comfort and closure to the victims. During the trial, Kelly's defense team alleging that accusers were just jilted lovers. Tonight, his lawyers saying they plan to appeal today's decision. Of course, Mr. Kelly is disappointed. He was not anticipating this verdict because based on the evidence, why should he anticipate this verdict? Kelly also facing a slew of other state and federal charges in multiple states stemming from abuse allegations. Among the women mentioned during testimony, famed R&B singer Aaliyah, who died in 2001. Prosecutors argued in a separate case that she forged her age on her birth certificate in order to marry R. Kelly when she was just 15 years old. One of the final witnesses in the trial described him abusing Aaliyah in 1993 when she was just 13 or 14 years old. That was not a couple. That was an abusive connection where someone trusted her producer and was preyed upon. I didn't want to bring this up, but over the years and after watching Surviving R. Kelly, I felt it was an obligation as a fan, as a journalist, and as a woman to address it. A representative for R. Kelly said the singer didn't know Aaliyah was underage. 15 is not of the age of legal consent, right? I mean... Right, except that my understanding is that she did not claim to be 15. And in order to get married, she had to lie about her age. And he is saying that he had no idea. No idea. In July 2019, he was arrested after a federal grand jury indicted him on 13 counts, including child pornography, enticement of a minor, and obstruction of justice. That trial was pushed back several times, in part to allow the Brooklyn trial to go first. And in February 2019, Kelly turning himself in after Cook County State's attorney charged him with multiple counts of aggravated criminal sexual abuse. R. Kelly has denied those allegations. Are you innocent? Can you describe the physical abuse? I wish that I would have been able to see the fullness of the monster I was dealing with. The furor over the R. Kelly sex abuse was reignited after a Lifetime documentary detailed allegations of sexual abuse by R. Kelly. Kelly has long denied all accusations of sexual misconduct and claimed his innocence in a testy 2019 interview on CBS This Morning. I didn't do this stuff. This is not me. I'm fighting for my life. He has consistently protested rather loudly against these claims against him. Stephanie Ramos joins us now. So what comes next and what kind of sentence is R. Kelly looking at? So R. Kelly is scheduled to be sentenced May 4th of 2022 and prosecutors today said Kelly faces a mandatory minimum of 10 years behind bars and up to life in prison, Lindsay. And give us a sense of the reaction pouring in from this verdict. Lindsay, so much reaction pouring in, especially on social media. So many people saying they just can't believe it's taken this many years to prosecute R. Kelly on his alleged sex crimes. Others saying that justice has finally been served. But there are, of course, supporters of the singer. But for the majority of the people out there, what we've seen is that they're feeling relieved by this verdict. Lindsay. Yeah, many saying that the action was not taken criminally until that documentary came out. Stephanie Ramos, our, our thanks to you. And for more on this verdict, we bring in Jim Pratt, R. Kelly's childhood friend and former bodyguard. Jim, thank you so much for coming on the show. Listen, in, in past interviews, you've said that you wish that you had done more early on to stop R. Kelly. What's your reaction tonight to this guilty verdict? Lindsay, it's um, just sad for everyone involved. Um, the young women, his children, fans. Um, it's almost like if someone has terminal cancer, you kind of are ready for outcome. But when it happens, it's still it's still kind of numbing. And um, 
I'm torn a little bit, to be honest with you. And have you sp spoken with Dre at all, who, of course, is R. Kelly's ex-wife, mother of his three children, and really like a sister to you? How is she responding to this verdict? I, I haven't. I haven't today. I would imagine, you know, she's uh, probably in, in, in disbelief, um, even though I think she was pretty prepared for it. Um, I imagine I will. I, again, I'm just really worried about... Um, her kids, you know, the, the three, the, her children. Um, it's got to be extremely hard. And, and Jim, I know we've talked in the past, you also said it uh, in the Surviving R. Kelly documentary, that when R. Kelly was tried that first time in, in Chicago, you said that when he came back, the verdict came back not guilty, you said you felt relieved. Why the change then with today's guilty verdict? Because of what I found out literally over the last six years in terms of people I've talked to, you know, Drea, um, to find out certain facts that I didn't know 20 years ago. Um, 20 years ago, it was not a litany of people, it was probably four or five individuals. And of course, when it's your friend, you're gonna, you're gonna back your friend, but just hearing and talking to some of the um, victims and um, hearing some of the testimonials and, and seeing the evidence, some of the things that I know to be true were just kind of shocking and, um, and when I found out. I, you know, I can understand the idea of wanting to back your friend. You know, you, you've known R. Kelly since you were both teenagers. You were 15 when you first met. You, you've talked about seeing him change over the years. But even if somebody is your friend, you might see some, some red flags early on. Were there any indicators for you that you went back later and you thought, oh, I guess that didn't quite add up? Yes, in, in hindsight, yeah, there were, Lindsay. Um, you know, when you're younger, when you're in your late 20s, and um, certain things, when you look back on it, yeah, you're, you're like, oh, wow, that um, that makes sense. Or, um, yeah, uh, there were there were some things. Um, and it, it troubles me. I'm not, I'm not going to lie about that. Um, certain things that I really can't talk about that I absolutely wish I had uh, had a foothold in and done, done something about. The jury agreed with prosecutors that R. Kelly's sex abuse amounted to a criminal enterprise, as his former friend and bodyguard. Did you see evidence of that kind of widespread operation? Were there other uh, people who were around him that you were concerned about early on? Not during the time that I was around. You got to remember, Lindsay, we're going from 15 until probably the second album. Um, you know, I got married shortly thereafter, and I wasn't really around during the 2001, 2, 3 period. Um, so I can't speak on what happened, you know, from 2000 on. Um, we were still cool. I still see him, but I wasn't in the studio like that, like I was for the first couple of albums. I can tell you this, if, if I was, uh, it'd be a probably a different outcome. If there were a, couple, a few of us that were childhood friends that were around, there'd probably be a different outcome versus a lot of people that are around him that I considered yes men. Is there anything that you'd like to say to his survivors tonight, to, to the many uh, uh, accusers and, and, and victims? I hope this brings them some solace. Um, you know, I pray for them. Um, you know, I know they've been through a lot. I've spoken with a lot of them, um, and uh, it's a lot. You know, and trust me, I've had long conversations with quite a few of them, and they're 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 hurting and still battling this 20 years later. You know, it's almost like a form of PTSD. It's not going away. A lot of them have, you know, got therapy. So I. Um, you know, I, again, I just hope this brings some sort of solace. But, Lindsay, it's a, it's a monumental tragedy all the way around. I mean, this is almost like a great tragedy. I mean, to see someone that you were friends with, poor, grow up, you know, we were in the L, you know, when he was singing for change and then become, at one point, the number one superstar, you know, in the world at one point and working with everyone to the fall like this. It's just like, it's literally like a great tragedy.
I understand that there's a lot that you want to say that you cannot say uh, publicly, at least. So uh, I do appreciate what you can share. And, and thank you so much for your time and, and talking with us tonight, Jim. Thank you, Lindsay. Appreciate it. Now switching gears to the push to end the pandemic and the new tool that's now available to help that happen. Talking, of course, about booster shots. Today, President Biden publicly got a Pfizer booster shot, but said vaccinating the unvaccinated is even more important than boosters. This comes as some vaccine mandates took effect in New York today, with roughly 72,000 hospital staff still unvaccinated who are now in danger of losing their jobs at midnight. The governor has the National Guard on standby to possibly replace those unvaccinated workers. Our Eva Pilgrim reports. Eight months after getting his second Pfizer shot, President Biden rolling up his sleeve today for a vaccine booster. Did you have any side effects with the second shot, Mr. President? No, I haven't any side effects the first or the second shot, thank goodness. Since the CDC gave the green light on Friday, thousands of newly eligible Americans lining up for a third Pfizer shot. But the 83 million people who received Moderna or Johnson & Johnson vaccines will need to wait a few more weeks for the FDA to review data on those booster shots. In the meantime, the CDC director says the vaccines are still working well. This is a very slow wane. There is no urgency here to go and get your, your booster immediately. You know, walk, don't run to your booster appointment, and we will come and get um, look at the data for Moderna and J&J &J &J in very short order. It comes as New York's vaccine mandate faces a critical test. We will not Tens of thousands of health care workers across the state risk losing their jobs if they refuse to get vaccinated by a midnight deadline. 16% of New York's health care workers are still unvaccinated. It's terrifying to me what's going to happen. The waits in ERs, the lack of care, the long waits for bells to be answered. But New York's governor ready to send in the National Guard and replacement health care workers. You need to be assured that the person taking care of you is not going to give COVID to you or your newborn. Can't we just say that that is a basic right that everyone has? This as children across the country are still getting infected with COVID at an alarming rate. But shots for younger children are on the horizon. Pfizer now planning to submit its trial data for kids ages 5 to 11 within days. Authorization could come by the end of October. We are all enthusiastically awaiting these data. It will go from the FDA to the CDC, and we will review it with similar urgency, and I'm hoping in the order of weeks. And tonight, some welcome news after a COVID scare on the set of The View on Friday. Co-host Sunny Hostin and guest host Ana Navarro, who are fully vaccinated, were told to leave the set after a positive test result moments before they were to welcome the vice president. Over the weekend, they learned Throughout those results weekend, were inaccurate. And I am thrilled to report that Sunny and Ana's Friday results turned out to be false positives and everyone is safe. <laughs> All feeling relieved that Sonny and Anna are well. Eva Pilgrim joins us now from New York. Eva, Pfizer plans to submit trial data on five to 11 year olds within days. How quickly could we see this move? Lindsay, we're told it could be weeks, not months. And when Pfizer releases this new data, we expect to have specific numbers as to how effective this vaccine is within this age group. We already know that five to 11 year olds will get one third of the adult dose, Lindsay. And late today, a court of appeals paved the way for America's largest school district, New York City, to mandate its public school employees get vaccinated. That's right, Lindsay. That mandate is supposed to take effect at midnight tonight. We know some 87% of all Department of Education employees here in New York have already gotten their first vaccine. Some 7,000 people have gone to get their first vaccine in recent days. Lindsay. All right, Eva Pilgrim, our thanks to you. Now to the moments of panic. After a train went off the rails in Montana late Saturday night, three people killed, dozens left injured, and now the NTSB is trying to get to the bottom of just what happened. ABC's Matt Gutman brings us the very latest. Oh my God, it's on its side. Tonight, the horror of this rail disaster in rural Montana as federal officials urgently investigate what caused this Amtrak passenger train to derail.
The NTSB on the scene saying today the derailment taking place on a gradual curve just before a rail switch. The black box revealing the train was traveling just under the 79 mile per hour speed limit. And as they take this train away, you can hear that grating sound and the damaged wheels inside of the train from where it derailed. But they're taking it away slowly and right inside there, you can see the debris from that derailment. More than 160 passengers and crew on that train traveling from Chicago to Seattle late Saturday when it derailed. Dozens were injured and tragically, three people were killed. Just an absolute tragedy there. Matt Gutman joins us now. Matt, this rail is actually really important for business. What kind of backups is it causing? A massive backlog. I mean, there, right now, there are 50 trains on hold across multiple states, many of them carrying grain. Typically, they'll ferry that grain from the heartland. You can see uh, miles and miles of uh, amber waves of grain behind me uh, to ports like Seattle. Uh, and so this is a key piece of national infrastructure that's being held up by the crash. Of course, the NTSB wants to be as careful as it possibly can be to glean all the perishable evidence it can before it lets those workers on the site that you see behind me, but apparently they've got what they needed so far, uh, including video, uh, pretty much uh, onboard video showing uh, even the moment of impact they're going through that frame by frame. But the key right now for rail officials is to clear this rail link as quickly as possible and get things flowing again. Lindsay. All right, Matt Gutman, thanks so much for that update. Now to the high stakes showdown in Washington as Democrats try to reach agreement on how to pass President Biden's ambitious agenda with those dual infrastructure packages at the center of the battle over spending. So can Democrats strike a deal this week? Here's ABC's congressional correspondent, Rachel Scott. With his entire agenda on the line, President Biden today optimistic Democrats will deliver. You know me, I'm a born optimist. I think things are going to go well. I think we're going to get it done. The House was set to vote on the $1 trillion bipartisan infrastructure bill today. But Speaker Nancy Pelosi has now pushed it off to Thursday. Uh, Speaker Pelosi, will you have the vote to get this passed by Thursday? Progressives say they will block the bill unless moderates in the House and Senate commit to also passing a much larger economic package. We can't have a situation where the Senate doesn't agree with us. Well, the whole bill has to be agreed upon, written, etc. The massive bill would cover everything from early childhood education to the fight against climate change and is said to be the largest expansion of the social safety net in more than 50 years. Do you think progressives and, uh, and moderates can come together on the reconciliation? We have and we should. By Thursday? Well, I don't know about the timing, but you know, we all work together. Everybody ought to work. It's, everybody's moving in a positive manner. They really are. But Senator Joe Manchin not on board with the bill's $3.5 trillion price tag. I care about size of the bill, sure. I did. And 3.5 is still too high for That's you. Pretty high. And now Speaker Pelosi conceding it's, quote, self evident that number will come down. Soon see just how low that number has to go. Rachel Scott joins us now. Rachel, today's scheduled vote on the bipartisan infrastructure bill pushed to Thursday at the earliest, but now there's really a, a log jam at the end of the week on several critical votes. Outline for us what's in store. Yes, Lindsay, it is crunch time here on Capitol Hill, starting with the government shutdown now just four days away. The Senate held a vote tonight to try to avoid the government shutdown. Moments ago, that vote failed. Republicans deciding to block the measure because it was also tied to raising the debt limit. Now, this is something that they have refused to do. They say if Democrats are going to propose trillions of dollars in new spending, then they should be the ones to raise the debt limit. But it's important to note here that nearly 98 percent of the nation's debt predates the Biden inauguration. A large chunk of that was added during the Trump administration, and the Treasury Secretary has now warned that if Congress does nothing, the government may not be able to pay its bills by October, Lindsay. Um, okay, that deadline is certainly looming very quickly. Rachel Scott reporting in from the Capitol. Thanks so much. It is the eve of the groundbreaking for former President Obama's presidential center on Chicago's South Side. And the former president sat down for an exclusive interview with our Robin Roberts, weighing in on the battle over spending in Washington and how to pay for President Biden's agenda. And even within the Democratic Party, there seems to be some divide. How do you think he is handling this particular moment and what does he need to do to pass his agenda? Well, it first of all, I, I think the uh, Build Back America program, the, the 
package that you describe is something that America desperately needs. And it's paid for by asking the wealthiest of Americans who have benefited incredibly uh, over the last several decades and even in the midst of a pandemic saw their wealth and assets rise enormously, asking them to pay a few percentage points more uh, in taxes in order to make sure that we have a economy that's fair for everybody. But should uh, they could be concerned that that's how they're going to have to, to pay for it, in essence? I think that they can afford it. We can afford it. I, I put myself in this category now. And you can see much more of Robin's exclusive interview tomorrow morning on Good Morning America. When we come back, the, quote, suspicious fall in the investigation into why a mother and toddler plunged to their deaths in a baseball park just before the beginning of a game. Our journey to the Arctic front lines in Greenland. We have heard so much about sea level rise. We are taking you straight to the source. But up next, why some say police dogs should be stripped of their duty and why the legalization of marijuana has made those calls even louder. Stay with us. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? <laughs> Can I hug you? Yeah. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. This is what being live is Please all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people no squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Let's go. Streaming straight to you anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA 3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. This is American history, a violent white mob, a brutal attack, 300 black Americans killed right here in America. Now, it is time to uncover Tulsa's buried truth, the gripping story brought to light in a new podcast from ABC News, available now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. We have to be really careful. Someone needs to go public. This is my real life we're talking about. Scared. This is the testimony of Elizabeth Holmes. Elizabeth Holmes is finally going to trial. To this day, Elizabeth maintains her innocence. We'll take you inside the courtroom. Follow the dropout, Elizabeth Holmes on trial, wherever you get your podcasts. Now with so much on the line, more Americans are turning to David Muir and ABC's World News Tonight than any other program across all of television. The FBI is now reporting the homicide rate in the U.S. is soaring. Last year, it was up nearly 30 percent from 2019. It's the biggest jump in 60 years, and most of the deaths were clustered in cities. Canine units have been part of policing in this country for decades, used to track down suspects and to help sniff out suspected drugs. But as drug laws in this country change, as more states legalize different forms of marijuana use, how useful are these canine units in everyday police work today? And do they complicate the already troubled problem of race and policing? ABC's Alex Perche takes a look. You're driving your mom's car, and, and you see the lights flashing behind you. What goes through your mind? I was scared, honestly. Nervous, you know, I'm not gonna say I wasn't nervous. It was August of 2018. What's going on, man? Then 18-year-old Tayon Lee had gotten pulled over by Louisville police. Mama, they taking me out the vehicle. Don't hop out. The officer's bringing in a canine to search the vehicle. That dog, Ripley, alerting for drugs. What are you thinking? Well, my heart dropped because I knew there wasn't drugs in that car. I dropped my head down. 
you know, I, I'm praying that everything, you know, that they're saying this and saying that. What's next? K-9 indication. That one signal from the K-9 gave the officers probable cause, allowing them to search the vehicle while Taeon stood on the side of a busy road in handcuffs, innocent, Some narcotics in insisting he didn't have drugs. I told him multiple times that I didn't when he asked me, because I didn't. The police never found anything illegal inside that car, but Taeon says what they left behind was an emotional scar, because for nearly 25 minutes, police and their K-9 unit turned that car inside out, even checking under the lid of his drink for contraband. All right, sir, here's your ID the back. reason officers pulled him over to begin with? A minor infraction. He allegedly made a wide turn. Police body camera footage viewed over a million times on YouTube. Critics say policing like this needs to change. Dogs make mistakes. Sometimes a mistake resides in the handler's suspicions. Uh, if the handler suspects that, in fact, drugs are present, it's very difficult to behave in such a fashion that you don't unconsciously cue the dog to alert. Scenes like this have played out across the country, leading some to ask, did the punishment fit the crime, or do these incidents undermine canine units at a time when police departments are under a microscope? Which begs the question, are they necessary or even helpful? I think people have found that the money, time, and resources that go into the programs really benefits the community, because the dogs can do so many amazing things that we as humans or police officers just wouldn't be able to do. You believe these dogs are saving lives? Absolutely, absolutely. Good boy, we met Sergeant Russell and his partner Taz in Alexandria, Virginia. Well, we'll just work on all the core basics of patrol work, which, which is which is which is tracking. So looking for suspects or missing persons, um, evidence searches. Sergeant Russell says his unit is constantly evolving. Over the summer, Virginia became the 16th state to legalize adult possession of marijuana up to one ounce, which has forced many drug sniffing dogs trained on pot into early retirement. Newer canines like Taz come in to train to sniff out the harder stuff, like cocaine, meth, and heroin. Police canines are often used in traffic stops when an officer needs to confirm a suspicion. But dogs trained on multiple drugs alert in the same way for all of them, making it impossible to tell whether they are indicating for marijuana or an illegal drug. Since dogs can't distinguish between a small legal amount of pot or a larger illegal amount of the drug, they can no longer be used to establish probable cause for a search in Virginia. There is no way to, to train a dog to, to signal at a certain amount of drugs. So, correct. So we figured it's better just, it's legal, so it's better just not, we don't want, we don't want it to be a tricky situation. For, yeah, it's, it's, it's better to not violate someone's rights than, you know, to maybe get a couple ounces of marijuana. As states like Virginia begin to legalize cannabis in one form or another, some law enforcement agencies around the country have been forced to change how they use their canines. What are some of the modern day challenges that you guys are dealing with now? Yeah, um, well, I think one of them was the, was the marijuana issue. That was a really big issue for a lot of agencies that say they had recently trained a dog two or three years ago on marijuana. You know, what do we do with that dog now? Well, and it's expensive to train these. Very dogs. expensive, absolutely. Yep. Each of these canines goes through about five months of patrol school where they're trained on things like agility, criminal apprehension, and obedience. Then they get certified and can work until they're about eight years old. According to the National Police Dog Foundation, a canine alone can cost $8,000. Then patrol school and other specialized training ranges from twelve dollars to $15,000. Check it. Like any tool used in law enforcement, these specialized dogs need upkeep and care and training. Check it. So what can canine police forces do today to help avoid any unnecessary and humiliating traffic stops? Certainly their sensory capacity. Certainly their training and the maintenance of that training. Certainly the training of the handler and the maintenance of that training. And factors such as things that might bias the handler or bias the dog, unconsciously cue things. What are some other things that, that we've seen kind of change um, in, in, in recent years or even decades? I think a lot of things have changed in, I think, a lot of agencies and handlers have gotten better at learning dog behavior. Police dogs have a tense history in the U.S., especially along racial lines. They were used in the South, first against enslaved blacks, and later in the 1960s against civil rights protesters. Why'd you take me out the car? Taeon Lee didn't have any previous criminal record at the time of his run-in with the law. He was graduating with several scholarships and was his school's homecoming king. Yet, he was forced to stand by the side of that Louisville road with just one thought on his mind. 
he didn't want to let down his mom. We had a positive indication about it came out. Okay? The historical context is one of the driving factors for him to speak out. You know, growing up young black male, you know, never wanted to put my mother in that, you know, that scenario to see me in handcuffs pulled over on the side of the road, canine dogs around, police officers around. She taught me way better than that. In a pending lawsuit against Louisville Metro Police and the officers, Lee is claiming he was targeted by the officers because of the color of his skin and that the stop violated his civil rights, which they have denied in court papers. ABC News has reached out to LMPD for comment but has not received a response. I honestly wanted it, you know, to be exposed, you know, what they did and how they're, you know, how they're judging people. Tayon's traffic stop did spark change in the Louisville Metro Police Department. A new policy was put in place for how officers pull people over. Those new practices include a nervous person or someone in a high crime area are not indicators to justify certain actions by police, as well as guidelines for handcuffing someone who is not under arrest. Please canine, open the door. As for canine policing. I think people recognize the fact that the dogs are amazing animals and their noses can do incredible things. So I think I think they're here to stay as long as canine teams continue to deploy them properly. Alex Perche, ABC News, Washington. An interesting debate there. Our thanks to Alex for bringing that to us. Still ahead here on Prime, the former Marine wanted for gunning down a sheriff's deputy and the statewide manhunt now taking place in Florida. The man who attempted to assassinate then President Ronald Reagan is granted an unconditional release from prison. We'll explain why. And why the pandemic was not nearly as bad as feared for women in certain lines of work. We take a look by the numbers, but first, our tweet of the day. Why are there goats walking around the heart of Atlanta? We will guide you through it all tonight. made it through another week together. Big hug, Richard. We taught all our patients how much they love to hold their hands. David, we're showing our love and support for all the ICU staff. They're the heroes in this. It was an extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcasts. The mysterious boyfriend. What does he even do over there? Tell me everything. You'll be okay. No one knows about us. He's the chief executive and she's a kid. You have committed multiple federal crimes. I want to talk to my lawyer. The White House disposed of me like a piece of trash. And they will do the same to you. Impeachment American Crime Story, Tuesdays at 10, only on FX. Available now on demand. This is what being live is all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded by people squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. Streaming straight to you anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. I know what happened, and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? And figure out what's really out there. This is the testimony of Elizabeth Holmes. Elizabeth Holmes is finally going to trial. To this day, Elizabeth maintains her innocence. We'll take you inside the courtroom. Follow the dropout, Elizabeth Holmes on trial, wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back, everyone, now to Women in Corporate America. A comprehensive new study by McKinsey and & Company and Lean In finds that women continued to advance to senior roles during the pandemic, but burnout has been a huge problem. We take a look by the numbers. 
24% of C-suite executives are women. That's a striking underrepresentation, but still a substantial gain from 2016. And during the pandemic, women's representation improved across most of the corporate pipeline, according to McKinsey. But 42% of corporate women say that they have often or almost always been burned out this year compared to 35% of men who say that. And one in three women say that they have considered downshifting their careers or leaving the workforce entirely this year. One reason the study authors suggest is that women may be doing more emotional work both at home and at the office and those efforts have gone unrecognized and unrewarded. For example, senior level women are two times more likely as senior level men to spend substantial time on diversity, equity and inclusion efforts that fall outside of their formal job responsibilities. 31% of employees say that their manager provided some emotional support during the pandemic when that manager was a woman. It dropped to 19% when the manager was a man. And finally, this study focuses on corporate women. Overall, more than 2.3 million American women across all industries dropped out of the labor force in 2020. And we still have lots to get to here on Prime tonight. Why Facebook has decided against moving forward with Instagram kids. Our journey to Greenland and the one thing that we're all used to that now is happening there that has scientists alarmed. And the Tony Awards finally took place again after its pandemic fueled hiatus. Will the future of Broadway bring with it more diversity? But first to look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. an extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcast. powerful stories of our time anytime nightline now streaming on abc news live 2020 true crime cinematic real life drama stunning the unthinkable follow the clues the hunt true crime 2020 now streaming on abc news live admit it these days what you need to know seems to change just about every day what is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA 3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? <laughs> How cute. Yeah. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. This is what being live is Three all seconds. about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people so squeezing into the bomb shelter. We're on urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. <laughs> Streaming straight to you anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. President Biden today rolling up his sleeve for another jab. The CDC recommended the third shot for medically vulnerable Americans, including seniors, those working in high-risk occupational settings, and immunocompromised individuals. Let me be clear, boosters are important. 
But the most important thing we need to do is get more people vaccinated. We're trying to do the what is at the best interest of our families. The majority of the nurses that I have spoken to that remain unvaccinated are sticking to their guns. Tricia Sebastian is among 72,000 health workers in New York who face a midnight deadline to be vaccinated or risk losing their jobs. New York Governor Kathy Hochul is preparing to bring in extra staff, even the National Guard, should hospitals need the help. A 40-year-old woman and her two-year-old son are now dead after falling from a concourse at Petco Park. Now, the lieutenant of San Diego PD tells me that the boy's father witnessed it all unfold. The mother and son are from San Diego who came here to watch a game and lost their lives moments before it started. Right now, police are trying to figure out if the fall was intentional or an accident, but releasing a statement saying the deaths appear to be suspicious. This is the first incident like this that I've ever heard of. It's a tragic event, and that's why we're giving it a very serious look. Today, a federal judge said the man who tried to kill President Ronald Reagan can be freed from restrictions next year if he remains mentally stable and continues to comply with rules. John Hinckley Jr. has been living in Virginia since his release from a Washington hospital in 2016. He lives under court-ordered restrictions, barring him from owning a gun, contacting Reagan's family, or actress Jodie Foster, who he was obsessed with when he shot Reagan in an attempt to impress her. Hinckley wounded President President Reagan, a Secret Service agent and a press secretary in the 1981 shooting, but was found not guilty by reason of insanity. The judge says he hasn't shown active signs of mental illness or violent behavior since 1983. And Instagram is pausing work on its app experience for children amid claims that Instagram is, quote, toxic for teens. A report from the Wall Street Journal recently revealed that Instagram increases body image issues for a third of all teenage girls on the app. But Facebook, which owns Instagram, says the report misinterprets the data. Despite the pause here, Instagram says that building Instagram kids is the right thing to do and that they'll continue to build parental supervision tools for teens. After two and a half years, the Tony Awards back to celebrate the return of live theater. Adrienne Warren winning for her portrayal of Tina Turner. Aaron Tveit winning Best Actor, the only one nominated for the award. A Tony's first. As for the night's biggest award, Best Musical, Moulin Rouge. And Matthew Lopez making history as the first Hispanic playwright to win Best Play for The Inheritance, taking the stage with a powerful message. The Latin community is underrepresented in American theater, in New York theater, and most especially on Broadway. This must change. The Rolling Stones are back. The rock legends took the stage in St. Louis, Missouri Sunday to launch their No Filter American Tour. The performance marked their first major concert without Charlie Watts, their drummer of nearly 60 years. The iconic band opened their set paying tribute to their friend with a stunning display of images from Watts' life and storied career. Charlie Watts died last month at the age of 80. Next tonight, to the search for a former Marine who allegedly gunned down a sheriff's deputy during a traffic stop in Florida. As Victor Akendo reports, police are warning he is likely armed and dangerous. Tonight, authorities are warning families in North Florida to lock their doors as they hunt for an alleged cop killer. If you're in a home and he breaks in your home and you have a gun, blow him out the door. Because he's like a rabid animal. He will kill you. Police say Patrick McDowell, a 35-year-old former Marine, shot Nassau County Sheriff's Deputy Joshua Moyers once in the face and once in the back during a traffic stop in Callahan outside Jacksonville Friday. <laughs> Moyers was pronounced dead on Sunday, just 29 years old, leaving behind a fiancé. They were planning their wedding. I just asked that everybody please keep them in their prayers. Investigators later finding a flashlight and a hat they believe is McDowell's and a gun possibly used to shoot a police dog during the search. The sheriff's office releasing these images of McDowell's distinctive tattoos, including one across his back reading death before dishonor. According to law enforcement, McDowell has been noted to suffer from PTSD.
Victor Akendo joins us now. Victor, was there a specific reason that some of the schools in the area went on lockdown as that surge played out? Lindsay, that's because McDowell is considered armed and dangerous. Here is the warning from the sheriff's office. Please lock your doors. Please call 911 if you see anyone fitting this description. Do not attempt to approach him. The reward for any information leading to an arrest, now up to $54,000. Lindsay? Lots of concern about locating him. Victor Akendo, our thanks to you. Finally tonight, as human-induced climate change fuels our warming planet, one of the most remote places in the world is changing right before our eyes. Greenland's ice is disappearing. Why do we all need to be paying attention to what's happening there? Our James Longman went all the way to the Arctic Circle and witnessed something rather extraordinary. Here's a sneak peek at part of our ABC News Live special, A Year of Extremes. Greenland. The world's largest island, known for its vast tundra and mammoth glaciers. But this beautiful Arctic desert is retreating. I'm standing right in front of the Russell Glacier here in Greenland, part of Greenland's melting ice sheet. And really what happens here is at the heart of the climate crisis. We headed for this Arctic front line to camp out on the ice and link up with a group of scientists and locals to see this changing world up close. This is Greenland's ice sheet. It makes up something like 85% of the whole of Greenland. Where we're standing, the ice is something like 60 meters thick. In some places, it's as thick as two miles. Last log drop took me on a quad bike to the edge of the Russell Glacier. Life here is rugged, to say the least. He spent 20 years watching things change. I'm a dog sledge uh, owner, have my own dog sledge. When I was uh, driving uh, dog sledge here 20 years ago, it was for seven months. Now it's only for five months because the season is going getting lower, the summer is getting warmer, but also more rain is coming down and a lot of things are, are changing. So you've lost two months of snow in 20 years? Yes. So if on that same trajectory in the next 20 years, you could only have three months of snow Come left? On. Yeah, we are fearing that. The ice in the Arctic is crucial to regulate the temperatures of the world. And it's not just an increase in temperatures that's causing them to melt. This is one of the most extraordinary walks I've ever been on. Walking through Greenland's ice sheet. And it's absolutely stunning. The dark patches you can see, that is silt, that is ground down rock that's coming up from underneath the ice. Thousands of years old. But further in, there's something called black ice. If you change the colour of the ice, then it's capable of absorbing almost all of the radiations. And it's becoming blacker because of the um, materials that we've been putting into the atmosphere. Some of that's natural through uh, dust from the global deserts. Uh, some of it's man-made directly, um, such as the pollutants from burning of fossil fuels. The forest fires that we've seen across the world, including Siberia, that liberate material onto the ice sheet. Richard Washington is a professor of climate science at the University of Oxford, and he tells us to take note of one small but very important element of our day. It's raining, when really it should be snowing. Rain here is rare, and at the centre of the ice cap last month, rain was recorded for the first time ever. What's it like for you being here, seeing all this? Well, for 20 years I've been, each of 20 years, I've been teaching about the Greenland ice sheet and its role in the climate system. And for the first time, here I am standing on it on a rainy day, would you believe, with the ice melt passing underneath us. So it's quite a moment. What you're looking at here is just ice melt. That's water running off Greenland's ice sheet. There are only two ice sheets anywhere in the world, one in Antarctica and the other one here. And it's important that this happens because Greenland contributes 8% of the Earth's fresh water. What's not so good is that it happens so fast. The melt here is accelerating and it's contributing to the rise in global sea levels. So from London to New York, from New Orleans to Shanghai, what happens here in Greenland affects all of us. 
The Arctic is the engine room of the climate system of the Earth. The Arctic is in the core, is the center, and controls much of the mechanisms that keep our climate system active. Over the last 40 years, the speed of this ice retreat has astonished even the scientists we met. What lies ahead for this Arctic wilderness and around the world is unknown. Research begins. But for Carlos Duarte, professor of marine science at King Abdullah University in Saudi Arabia, it is not too late. He's studying ways to reverse and stop global climate change. And he says the signs of it are all around us. We went up over the Russell Glacier to get a better look. These stunning turquoise melt lakes, a sign of deterioration on the ice sheet. The buildup of water creates these massive sinkholes. If you are a scientist working on uh, marine ecosystems, working on the biosphere and ecology, you need, to, you need to face climate change. The answer, he says, could be in the mud beneath the ice. Duarte says as the ice retreats, it leaves mud churned up from the billion-year-old rock below. That mud, he hopes, is chemically unique and can trap carbon. His proposal, transfer massive amounts of this special mud into the ocean to keep it from releasing more climate-warming carbon into the atmosphere. It's almost like the Earth is giving you the medicine it needs. You just have to go and yes. find it. You just have to go and find it. While Duarte tries to heal the ice, those who call Greenland home hope the world is paying attention. Do you feel like the world is listening to you? They haven't for a long time, but I do sense that things are, are changing. Mm -hmm. A need to be heard and an increasing call to take action before a critical international summit this fall. I think we have uh, a choice to make here. Do we want to allow the temperatures to continue increasing and have a very negative effect on, for example, agricultural production, on uh, our health systems? Do we want to allow our children to walk into a broken planet, a uh, broken environment where they will not be able to thrive? Or do we want to make the change that are necessary in order to open possibilities that are much better for us. Because here's the thing that we have to remember. This is not about saving the planet. Frankly, the planet has been around for 4.5 billion years, and she started without us. She didn't ask us for any opinion, okay? She has been around and she will continue. If we are stupid enough to press the button on the ejector seat and make Earth uninhabitable for us, she will continue perfectly happily without us. This is not about saving the planet. This is about ensuring that the conditions, the environmental conditions that have made this planet habitable for us, that they actually continue. That is what this is about. Some stunning scenes there. Our thanks to James. Chief Meteorologist Ginger Z will have much more on what's happening to our planet in our 30-minute long ABC News Live special, A Year of Extremes, tomorrow night on ABC News Live at 8.30 p.m. Eastern and also streaming on Hulu. Before we go tonight, our image of the day, let's all collectively say, aw, our colleague and friend ABC News Live anchor Diane Macedo is now the mommy of a baby girl. Diane tells us that she and her husband are so happy and that they their slightly older son is, quote, reacting surprisingly well so far. We hope they are getting some rest as they settle into their new family of four. Congratulations. That is our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Coming up in the next hour, we're staying on top of a few things, including that guilty verdict for disgraced singer R. Kelly. But his music is so popular, often heard during weddings and on the radio. Can we separate the music from the man? We'll talk about it. And artificial intelligence. Where is technology heading? Should we embrace it or be terrified of it?
what being live is all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're gonna move back, let's move back. We're surrounded by people squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. Streaming straight to you, anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. Robin Roberts, George Stephanopoulos, Michael Strahan. Wake up with America's number one most watched morning show, ABC's Good Morning America. Hey there, I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We're monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. It is a game of chicken playing out in Washington, D.C., and America could be left dealing with the fallout. It's unclear if America will default on its debt. The GOP and Democrats continue speaking past each other while Democrats continue to fight amongst themselves about reaching a deal on a massive infrastructure bill to accompany the bipartisan bill. Still, it remains unclear just who will blink first. Northwestern University is suspending all fraternity activities on campus. The Illinois school made the move after reports of people being drugged without consent during events at two on-campus frat parties. Police are also investigating. And police in Utah are investigating the circumstances that led to the death of a University of Utah football player. Sophomore Aaron Lowe was shot and killed at a house party just a few hours after a game. Police are looking for a suspect. Now to the pandemic and the public display of confidence today in booster shots by President Biden. The president getting his booster, but the president with a loud and clear message for unvaccinated Americans. A quarter of the country cannot go unvaccinated and us not to continue to have a problem. Our Eva Pilgrim reports. Eight months after getting his second Pfizer shot, President Biden rolling up his sleeve today for a vaccine booster. Did you have any side effects with the second shot, Mr. President? No, I haven't any side effects the first or the second shot, thank goodness. Since the CDC gave the green light on Friday, thousands of newly eligible Americans lining up for a third Pfizer shot. But the 83 million people who received Moderna or Johnson & Johnson vaccines will need to wait a few more weeks for the FDA to review data on those booster shots. In the meantime, the CDC director says the vaccines are still working well. This is a very slow wane. There is no urgency here to go and get your, your booster immediately. You know, walk, don't run to your booster appointment and we will come and get, um, look at the data for Moderna and J&J and &J in very short order. It comes as New York's vaccine mandate faces a critical test. We will not Tens of thousands of healthcare workers across the state risk losing their jobs if they refuse to get vaccinated by a midnight deadline. 16% of New York's healthcare workers are still unvaccinated. It's terrifying to me what's going to happen. The waits in ERs, the lack of care, the long waits for bells to be answered. But New York's governor ready to send in the National Guard and replacement healthcare workers. You need to be assured that the person taking care of you is not going to give COVID to you or your newborn. Can't we just say that that is a basic right that everyone has? This as children across the country are still getting infected with COVID at an alarming rate. But shots for younger children are on the horizon. Pfizer now planning to submit its trial data for kids ages 5 to 11 within days. Authorization could come by the end of October. We are all enthusiastically awaiting these data. It will go from the FDA to the CDC and we will review it with similar urgency and I'm hoping in the order of weeks. And tonight, some welcome news after a COVID scare on the set of The View on Friday. Co-host Sunny Hostin and guest host Ana Navarro, who are fully vaccinated, were told to leave the set after a positive test result moments before they were to welcome the vice president. Over the weekend, they learned Throughout those the results weekend, were inaccurate. And I am thrilled to report that Sonny and Anna's Friday results turned out to be false positives and everyone is safe, <laughs> healthy, and COVID-free. 
We were glad to hear that news as well. Our thanks to Eva. After decades of suspicion and allegations, R. Kelly, who shot to fame with his hit, I Believe I Can Fly, has been found guilty of racketeering in his sex trafficking trial in Brooklyn federal court today. The singer remaining motionless with eyes downcast as the verdict was read. Stephanie Ramos has more. Tonight, after decades of suspicion and allegations, it took just nine hours of deliberation for a Brooklyn jury to find R&B singer R. Kelly guilty on all counts. The singer facing decades in prison for eight counts of sex trafficking and one count of racketeering, alleging Kelly was the leader of an enterprise made up of individuals who would, quote, recruit women and girls to engage in illegal sexual activity with Kelly, arranging for them to travel to concerts throughout the United States. Today's guilty verdict forever brands R. Kelly as a predator who used his fame and fortune to prey on the young, the vulnerable, and the voiceless for his own sexual gratification. To the victims in this case, your voices were heard and justice was finally served. Over the course of six weeks, jurors hearing testimony from 50 witnesses, some of them victims. Gloria Allred represents several of the witnesses. I have been practicing law for 47 years. During this time, I have pursued many sexual predators who have committed crimes against women and children. Of all the predators that I have pursued, however, Mr. Kelly is the worst. During the trial, Kelly's defense team alleging that accusers were just jilted lovers. Tonight, his lawyers saying they plan to appeal today's decision. Of course, Mr. Kelly is disappointed. He was not anticipating this verdict because based on the evidence, why should he anticipate this verdict? Kelly also facing a slew of other state and federal charges in multiple states stemming from abuse allegations. Kelly has long denied all accusations of sexual misconduct and claimed his innocence in a testy 2019 interview on CBS This Morning. I didn't do this stuff. This is not me. I'm fighting for my life. Our thanks to Stephanie Ramos for that. Today's verdict obviously marks a major moment in pop culture history. R. Kelly received a total of 26 Grammy nominations throughout his career. He collaborated with everyone from Stevie Wonder to Celine Dion and Lady Gaga. His chart-topping hits were played everywhere from the pulpit to children's movies to advertisements. So where does his legacy go from here? Joining us now to discuss the impact of today's verdict from the pop culture perspective is ABDC News contributor and serious XM radio host, Mr. Mike Muse. Thanks so much for joining us tonight, Mike. Hey, Lindsay. Thank you so much for having me. Happy Monday. Happy Monday to you, my friend. So where does R. Kelly's musical legacy go from here, man and music? I think we're entering an era now, Lindsay, where it's difficult to separate. You know, there's a time where you can say you can separate the artist from the person. Uh, I don't think we're in that space anymore. I think because of the access to information, uh, because of social media, and because of the way that we've been able to cover the allegations and now the trial, we're going to begin to learn so much. And so we're in a space now where you can't undo what you now know. And the amount of things that he has been now charged with uh, and found guilty of, it's such an accumulation that it's hard to undo. Uh, it's hard to undo uh, in your mind when a song comes on by R. Kelly, uh, all of these things that he's done to women and the predatorial nature uh, of his behavior. Uh, as you begin to listen to some of the songs, you can't help but thinking, is he invoking a young person, right? You can't help but think, you know, was he singing these songs while he was holding captive uh, young women in his home and in his studios? And so I think going forward, Lindsay, is not so much about the legacy of R. Kelly, but it, I think the legacy will be the absence of R. Kelly's music. I think it will be the absence of his catalog. Uh, you know, there was a time where you could, I'm from the Midwest, Lindsay, so there was a time when uh, you will be hard pressed not to hear R. Kelly's song at a barbecue, at a party, um, at a house party, right? Because it's such a Midwest vibe. Uh, but now I think you would begin to notice the absence uh, of his music. So you say the absence. Do you feel like all together, I mean, with regard to the music industry in particular, music streaming services, how will they navigate this? Do they pull the plug entirely? 
That's a really great question that you asked. I think that's a conversation that, you know, those streaming sites will have to wrestle with, as well as it's a thing that consumers will have to wrestle with. You know, we're also, too, at an age now where consumers want to know the value system of the corporate goods and the stores that they buy things from, right, from the corporation. They want to know what the corporation's constitutions are. They want to know what their mission statements are. And so I think that now people and activists and those who care about the rights of women and protecting predatorial nature will begin to raise the issue of what are these sites going to do? Are you continuously going to allow money to go into the pockets uh, of an individual who has now been found guilty uh, before it was still not clear cut because technically he is innocent until proven guilty? Uh, well, today that changes. He is now found guilty. Uh, and so now the onus is now going to be up. Now that these streaming services know this, do they still choose to, one, make money off him, provide profits to someone who has been found guilty of such predatorial behavior. Uh, but, Mike, I mean, you well know that, that, that folks are still playing Step in the Name of Love at weddings. I was at a restaurant not long ago. One of his songs started playing. A handful of people in the restaurant started to complain. What do you think, I mean, you know, people might still be listening in, in their cars, in their radio, but is there a separation of church and state here? Can you still appreciate the music um, and, and basically disavow the man? You know, that's why I made my statement earlier that nowadays, Lindsay, I think that time period is before, maybe four years ago, three years ago, two years ago, it was easy for people to separate uh, behavior from the art. I, I think now the overwhelming abundance of it is just too difficult now to separate the behavior from the art. Uh, but now it's going to be a, such a personal decision that people are going to make, to make. I know I've had R. Kelly songs pop up in my playlist, uh, and I've actually had to skip it. Uh, I've been at group gatherings where R. Kelly songs have come on, and a collective chorus was like, no, no, turn, skip. Um, and so I think you're obviously going to have people who are just indifferent. Uh, you're still going to have people who are willing to, to listen um, to an R. Kelly song if it comes on. But I think more now so, you're going to start having people say, no, skip the music, play something else. You know, people are going to be convicted now of that. And that's because R. Kelly's music, he was the soundtrack of so many genres and artists. His artistry transcends genres. And so no matter what, there always is a touch point uh, of R. Kelly. And so I think this is the first time someone like his artistry uh, has been convicted in a way uh, that we haven't seen that's really going to challenge the social construct uh, of society today on do they push play? Do they step in that name of love or do they skip it? Do you think that it's possible that this case might trigger a second wave of, of the hashtag Me Too movement in the music industry? Absolutely. I think it just takes one. I think the challenge, as you also know well, Lindsay, is that a lot of times women or men who have been sexually abused have felt like they've been misled and betrayed by older or predatorial nature individuals who have such power. Uh, the interesting thing about R. Kelly was his access, the love that people had for him, the adoration that he had, and his ability to be so financially sound to create such mechanisms that allow such predatorial behavior to go unchecked. Uh, and so as a result, one would think that individual could never be taken down. No one would ever believe me. But I think now this is signaling a signal to women and to men who've ever been sexually abused that now their story can be heard will be heard, and now there is a blueprint for a way to charge him uh, or that individual, and then also, too, to be able to get a conviction now that there's a blueprint there. Uh, so I do believe that we will begin to see possibly more other instances. It's just like in the film industry with Harvey Weinstein. We start seeing so many other individuals start to come out, too, as well, uh, and accuse other individuals in Hollywood of the Me Too. So I don't see the music industry being any exception. And lastly, Mike, it, many of us remember decades ago when another iconic artist, Aaliyah, was singing about aging nothing but a number, right? Many of us cut a little rug to that. We're singing right along with it. We knew she was young then, underage even. He was clearly much older. Many people didn't say anything at all. What does that say about us as a society? Yeah, it's a really great question that you asked, Lindsay, and thank you for bringing it with such sensitivity to that. You know, I remember I'm from Michigan. She's from Detroit, from Lansing, Michigan. I remember being in a nightclub and we got the news that Aaliyah had passed away and the music stopped. Not only did it stop in the city where I was at, but across the state of Michigan, the music stopped. The clubs let out. There was such a love that we have for Aaliyah. I think what we were experiencing was we didn't really know the predatorial nature of R. Kelly. Uh, during that time period, and I'm not making excuses for it, and shame on me, right, and shame on us. 
uh, for even kind of winking and giving it a pass and maybe not taking it so serious and looking as tabloid fodder and not looking at it as a young girl who was being taken advantage of by an individual of fame and access and creating predatorial natures. We didn't have the language for that, Lindsay. We didn't have the, the know-how to understand really what was happening. And possibly maybe some of us thought it was a one-off. Maybe some of us thought it was permission. But at the end of the day, that should never be permissible. At the end of the day, that should never be tolerated. Uh, and at the end of the day, we should never allow a young person, man or woman, to be taken advantage of by a predatory nature. And we should never look at it as that's just Hollywood. I think the days of that is over. So shame on all of us uh, who didn't hold him to the fire back then. But I just don't think we knew the gravity. That's not an excuse, but we just didn't know the gravity of uh, the predatory nature that was R. Kelly. Mike Muse, always good to talk to you, my friend. Thank you so much. Appreciate your time and your insight. Thank you so much, Lindsay. Next to the fallout from that new bombshell documentary on Britney Spears, insiders are breaking their silence about alleged surveillance of the pop superstar during her conservatorship, which could now be in its final days. Kaylee Hartung has more. In a new bombshell documentary, The New York Times presents Controlling Britney Spears, insiders are speaking out about the intense surveillance system that they say was ordered to closely monitor the pop star during her 13-year conservatorship. Her phone, her own phone and her own private conversations were used so often to control her. In the documentary, a former employee of Black Box Security, Alex Vlasov, alleges Britney's iPhone was mirrored so they could keep tabs on her private conversations and much more. You would be able to see all messages, all FaceTime calls, notes, browser history, um, photographs. They would also monitor conversations with her friends, um, with her mom, with her lawyer, Sam Ingham. The Times reporting that mirroring text messages without the consent of both parties could be a violation of the law, and that it is unclear if the court knew about or had approved any text message monitoring. Vlasov also claiming the security firm put an audio recording device in her bedroom. When I took a step back and I looked at everything, it really reminded me of somebody that was in prison. And security was put in a position to be the prison guards, essentially. Court records obtained by the Times show that Spears quietly pushed to end her conservatorship for years and told a judge in a closed-door hearing in 2019 that she felt coerced to perform and to enter a mental health treatment facility against her will. This summer, after publicly testifying for the first time in court, Spears was allowed to hire a new attorney, former federal prosecutor Matthew Rosengart. Rosengart telling ABC News overnight, unauthorized recording or monitoring of Britney's communications represent an unconscionable and disgraceful violation of her privacy rights, adding placing a listening device in Britney's bedroom would be particularly horrifying and corroborates so much of her compelling, poignant testimony. In response to the allegations in the documentary, a lawyer for the head of Black Box told ABC News, Mr. Yemeni and Black Box Security have a strict policy against discussing matters concerning their clients or their operations. But Mr. Yemeni and Black Box have always conducted themselves within professional, ethical and legal bounds. And they are particularly proud of their work in keeping Ms. Spears safe for many years. And an attorney for Jamie Spears telling ABC News in part, Jamie loves Britney unwaveringly and wants only the best for her. All of his actions were well within the parameters of the authority conferred upon him by the court. His actions were done with the knowledge and consent of Britney, her court-appointed attorney, and or the court. Our thanks to Kaylee for that. Artificial intelligence has been slowly introduced to our society from unlocking your phone with your face, personalizing your feed on social media, to using digital voice assistants. But how will AI impact our future? The former president of Google China, now the CEO of Cinovation Ventures and best-selling author Kai Fu Li joins us to discuss his new collection of short stories co-written with Chen Chu Fan called AI 2041, a blend of fiction and nonfiction. Imagining the future of artificial intelligence and how it could shape our world for the better or worse. Welcome to the show. Thanks so much for joining us. You've written that, quote, we often overestimate what technologies can do in five years and underestimate what they will be able to do in 20. So where do you think that we are in our understanding of AI and the impact that it'll have on both our, our short-term as well as long-term future? 
Oh, well, Lindsay, I think we're just at the very beginning of the AI revolution. Uh, we are right now seeing AI already beating humans in playing games, in reading radiology, in diagnosing many kinds of human uh, illnesses, and in scientific endeavors like protein folding. This is going to ex increase exponentially. Um, my, my day job is investing in high-tech companies, and we are seeing very powerful robots, autonomous vehicle, drug discovery uh, coming out in the next three to five years. And if you extrapolate, as um, I did in the book, to uh, 2041, I think we will see a pervasive use of robotics from industrial, commercial to uh, household use. And uh, humans will largely not be driving anymore. And uh, there will be jobs taken from us in the factories. But on the flip side, we won't have to do routine work anymore. The idea of humans not driving anymore, that, that makes me a little bit nervous. In your book, you discuss seven AI developments that could change how we live and work. Talk about just a few of those and the positive impact that they could have. Uh, sure. Uh, well, I think we spend about 9% of our time driving, and just saving that time will allow us to use the time we have in the car uh, to uh, productively, the, and the accidents will come down dramatically. Estimated about 90% of human fatalities will be gone. Um, also, I think in robotics, we can look forward to household, record, uh, household um, uh, robots that will cook for us and clean for us, and really taking away our uh, need to do routine work. Uh, AI today can optimize for internet giants um, in, to help them make more money, to show us the videos we want to watch. But in the future, AI can become smarter and more uh, knowledgeable about our long-term needs and learn to make us more knowledgeable and happier and become our uh, com companion, leading to a truly symbiotic human AI uh, symbiosis. Now that I might invest in one of those robots who cook and clean. In your view, what are some of the common misconceptions about artificial intelligence and any potential dangers that it could pose and, and whether any of those fears are actually warranted? Sure, I think the uh, greatest misconception is that AI is human-like and it will have human desires and emotions and to control us and hurt us and fall in love with us, all those good and bad things. But AI is in fact right now just watching so much data, uh, a AI driver will have driven a billion miles and an AI surgeon will have um, had the experience of a million surgeries. And no wonder it's better than people, but it's largely just watching uh, data and taught by human on what to optimize and does so in a better way than people. That said, there are still a lot of dangers that are real. If used um, in incorrectly or um, maliciously, AI can be used uh, at our expense. We all know about internet companies that potentially can uh, use AI to get us addicted to content, to make us more extremist in our views. And such, uh, such efforts, I think, are um, understandable in some sense because they are commercially oriented and need to make money. But I think in the longer term, uh, there will be better apps, better internet uh, applications that look after our long-term interests, that develop content um, in ways that make us better. And I think that will be a way out of that uh, problem. Also, we hear about AI sometimes is uh, unfair or biased. And that can be largely fixed by technology, by just having software uh, used by AI programmers that watch for balance of data and alert when there might be issues with respect to um, uh, uh, fairness. So I think a lot of the issues can be solved by technology. We haven't had enough chance for the technologists to solve those problems. The same as when internet first were, was connected to PC, there were viruses all over the place, but given five or 10 years, the technologists come up with ways such as antivirus software. And I'm convinced that given five or 10 years, technology solutions along with regulations will keep the AI issues under control. And finally, this book is written in a unique way, combining both fiction as well as nonfiction. Why did you decide to write in that format, and what challenges did it pose? Uh, because I see so much misconception about AI, and 
a lot of it is caused by people feeling this is rocket science. They're intimidated by the complexities of technology. So uh, uh, I think writing it in a way that is engaging and even entertaining uh, can reach out to everybody who wants to know more about AI. Uh, they can just read the stories uh, written by my co-author Chen Chufan, who is an award-winning science fiction writer, uh, or read everything, his stories followed by my analysis for a fuller understanding. I, I hope this approach uh, can lead to a better, fuller understanding of what AI can do, what problems there are, and how they might be solved uh, so people won't be looking at AI and feeling uh, fear or paranoia or this is a negative technology. Uh, I hope to really uh, express my strong belief that all technologies uh, are fundamentally neutral. Uh, they can be used by good or bad people, but over time, all great technologies like electricity and internet uh, have been enhanced by technological uh, solutions that address the downside. And there are a lot more good people than bad people. So we benefit greatly uh, from uh, electricity and internet. And I think in the future, when we look back 20 years from now, we will also see that we are uh, unbelievably uh, beneficiaries uh, from the AI revolution. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Really some interesting insight there. Kai Fuli, author of the new book, AI 2041, is now available wherever books are sold. And still to come, the protests rocking Chile and why they could be connected to some of the Haitians seeking refuge here in America. And the special group of grandmas making sure we don't go hungry. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is what would you do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. This is what being live is Three all seconds. about. Bye, fuel. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people squeezing, squeezing into this bomb shelter. Run, urgent delivery, run with Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. Streaming straight to you, anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. This is American history, a violent white mob, a brutal attack, 300 black Americans killed right here in America. Now, it is time to uncover Tulsa's buried truth, the gripping story brought to light in a new podcast from ABC News, available now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. Sex, gambling, fraud, betrayal, and murder. Cutthroat Inc., the podcast. The a family truth. on a mission to find their son. A year's worth of conversations with the killer cutthroat inc subscribe for free now on your favorite podcast app Assault on the Capitol, the ABC News original, exclusively on Hulu, now streaming. Now with so much on the line, more Americans are turning to David Muir and ABC's World News Tonight than any other program across all of television. Welcome back. We are tracking several international headlines at this hour. More immigration fallout, but this time in South America as hundreds of Chileans took to the streets over the weekend to ruthlessly burn tents and items belonging to migrants from both Venezuela and Haiti. The protest came after the government evicted a migrant camp that was occupied by families, many with children and babies. Local authorities claim the camp was, quote, a sanitary risk. After almost 16 years as leader of Europe's most powerful economy, Angela 
Angela Merkel will be leaving the chancellorship behind as Germany votes on a new parliament. However, neither her party nor its opponents have the majority needed to be declared the winner, so they'll have to form coalitions to determine who will govern the country. It could take weeks, if not months, of negotiations between the parties before a coalition government is fully formed. Lastly, some residents of La Palma are still being told to stay indoors as lava continues to flow. Scientists warn it's still too early to say whether the volcano's eruption phase is finished, but the good news is the volcano has stopped releasing clouds of ash. COVID's global impact is reaching areas beyond the healthcare industry. Overseas supply chain shortages due to the pandemic have customers feeling the strain at the pump. ABC's Maggie Rooley reports in from London. Tonight, the worst fuel crisis to hit Britain in decades. I didn't think it would be as bad as it actually was until I actually came out on the roads, and it was awful. At least two-thirds of the country's gas stations now running on empty. A severe shortage of truck drivers leaving pumps dry across the UK. It took us more than an hour of driving around London just to find a station that was open with gas. And once we're here, this is what we find. More than 100 cars waiting in line. The UK has lost tens of thousands of drivers this past year, many forced to leave the country because of new visa rules for foreign workers after Brexit, others unable to get a license during lockdown, and some saying poor conditions have led many to leave their jobs. Government officials today claim there is more than enough gas to go around and blame the shortage on panic buying, triggered after BP said it would be forced to ration gas due to a lack of drivers. Now, Lindsay, some of these issues like Brexit are specific to the UK, but many of them are things you're also facing in the US. Problems like staffing shortages, people leaving to find work with better pay and panic buying. You know, this is a crisis that is not limited to the UK and it's something we're watching closely in the US as well. Lindsay. Maggie, thank you. And finally tonight, Will Gans brings us a story about a very special group of grandmas. Nestled just across the river from Wall Street, right past Lady Liberty, and Oteca Maria serving up your grandma's greatest dishes, or Nona's as they're lovingly called here. Some from Italy, some from Greece, Sri Lanka, Argentina, Japan, and beyond to serve up their specialties. These ladies love to come out of the kitchen and they love to ask you how you like their food. I think it, it's really uh, it's just celebrating of cultural diversity. But just a year ago, the restaurant, like many in New York City, had to close its doors. Our cooks are our grandmothers, so we had to really just shut down. So he began making soup every Saturday for his community. We would uh, give out soup to first responders and, you know, uh, central employees or whoever happened to come through that door. Just last month, the restaurant finally reopening. To be back in the kitchen, to welcome customers back. Yes. How does it feel? Beautiful. I feel very good because uh, I don't want to stay home. Mm -hmm. I want to come to work. I miss this restaurant. I miss the people, the customers. Each Nona on staff preparing their specialty dish whenever they're in the kitchen. Nona Maria's specialty, zucchini parmigiano, which she agreed to show us firsthand. Woo! Bravo. The food delicious, the kitchen staff as diverse as they are delightful. And the small Staten Island restaurant bringing them all together, America Strong. My friend Flavio in the studio and I, we are planning on making a trip to Nona's Kitchen. So hungry now. That is our show for tonight. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Have a great night.